Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled An Intuitive Explanation of Fluxgate Current Sensing Part 2 Single Ring Open Loop. This is a joint work with Evgeny Smidochik. Now this is the second part. The first part was what is a fluxgate, just an introduction. And then hopefully I'm going to have a part three, multiple ring closed loop, and a part four, sensor with magnetic flux concentration. There are two videos which are relevant to this presentation, to this part two. There is an intuitive explanation of flux the current sensing, this is the part one, and here is the link. And then there is a simulation of physical inductor by LT Spice, and I'm going to put these links at the description part of the YouTube video that you are now watching. So just recapping the part one, if we have a nonlinear inductor, and for example, one which is built around a ferrite with some saturation limits of the magnetic flux density, and then if we have excitation of this inductor pushing with the current, this is a voltage source and a resistor, a series resistor, and then the current is pushing this uh, curve, this BH curve into saturation. And then if we have a additional current here coming in, which is moving the steady state or the operating point, you might say a little bit farther, this is the current and it's causing a delta B here. So this would be like the operating point around which this excursion is happening. And then if we look at this current, and here it is, this is this current, then without current coming in, it's going to be a symmetrical waveform. And the reason for this waveform is that during the time that the inductor is still not in saturation, the current is limited by the impedance. But then when it goes into saturation, the current is becoming high, limited by the series resistor. So this is the waveform of the current without this external excitation. Now, if I look at the second harmonics of this current, and this I can do by multiplying this current with the twice the frequency, then this product will be with zero DC when there is no external excitation. And here we see the first harmonic, that's the basic harmonic, and there is no practically no second harmonic. But with an excitation, there is an asymmetry of this waveform, this current. Multiplying it by twice the frequency gives us a waveform with non-zero average. And indeed, we have here this uh, second harmonic peak in the spectrum. So we can now use this behavior in order to build a very simple current sensing device. Now we have here a toroid, which is pushed beyond saturation or towards saturation by this uh, square wave. We have a power amplifier, we need quite a bit of a current here. We look at the current and we extract the second harmonics. And in this case, we have a filter here. So this output represent the second harmonic, and the second harmonic is a function of this disturbance which is provided by this uh, current which we want to set. So I'm going to simulate such a circuit by considering this uh, toroid, ferrite toroid, which was actually used in the previous uh, part one video. So it's a ferrite core. We have here the BH curve, you see here the saturation. These are the dimensions which are used in order to extract the equation which represent this flux for the LT spice simulation. So here it is. This is the equation that describes the flux. Again, this is in the previous video that I've cited. This is the nonlinear inductor. Here is the excitation. We have here the injection of the current which represent the measured current. Now, since I'm assuming here 10 turns, then in order to emulate this disturbance, uh, the current I need here is 
only one tenth of the actual measured current. Here is the twice the switching frequency, which is multiplied by the current to get a signal which is proportional to the second harmonic. And here is an example of the result. We see here the current measured, that is this current here. This is the excitation. This is the output of the second harmonic signal after filtration. And here we see this second harmonic, so that by looking at this second harmonic, we can tell that there is a current which is disturbing this uh, operating point, you might say. And as it turns out, there is a nice linear relationship between the output, the second harmonic output, and the sensed signal. So this is very nice. However, we have to remember that the BH curve is temperature dependent and also frequency dependent. So therefore, uh, this is not a very stable system. And uh, although it can be used, of course, and it'll give you an indication, but this is not a very precise way of measuring the current. This is just an example of one way of doing it if you don't need a very precise measurement of the current. So this is a relatively simple circuit to use. Another way to sense the output will be to use actually the duty cycle. So let me explain it by considering the flux. As I've shown in part one, this flux, when you have an excitation, goes from saturation one side to saturation the other side. And if you have a measured current in this case, this will be non-symmetrical, that is you are pushing the curve by this uh, measured current. And therefore the slope here and the slope here are different. And consequently, this part here and this part here are not of the same length, okay, the same duration. And therefore you can use this duty cycle, you might say, between this part and this part, and I'm showing it here. This is without any measured current. These are equal. This is, again, the excitation current. This is with some current, it's a, a little bit larger here. And then, with a higher current, you have it even larger than that. So this would be another way to actually sense the output from this circuit. I'm going to go back to it later on with another configuration. And now I'm moving to another method of current sensing with the flux gate, which is based on self-oscillation rather than external excitation of the core. So, to explain it, let me start with this RC oscillator, which is built around a comparator with feedback that makes it like a Schmitt trigger, and these two resistors are setting the lower level and high level of the triggering. And here we have a feedback to this capacitor, which is being charged. As it hits the high threshold, then it will swing back and the voltage will go down, and then it will go down until it reaches the lower threshold. And so therefore, we're going to have here an oscillator. This is, of course, very well known from CMOS oscillator, RC oscillator. Now, as it turns out, you can build the same oscillator or same type of oscillator by an inductor and a resistor. And the idea is very simple. If you have here voltage, then again, depending on the uh, time constant here, you have just about a straight line here, a slope, a constant slope. Uh, here also you don't have a constant slope depending on the RC circuit, of course, the RC time constant. So it's very similar. You generate here a slope and therefore it hits the threshold and then it goes back and it hits the second threshold. So the waveform here and the waveform here are basically the same, except that here you are charging and discharging a capacitor, while here, by having a voltage here, you generate a going up and down current. So the end result is having here 
this triangular waveform uh, here and also here. Now, if we put here an inductor which gets into saturation, then the waveform will be a little bit different. And what will happen here is that as the current goes up and the voltage builds up, it will first cause here saturation. Then, of course, the current will start going up very quickly, hit the higher threshold, which will, of course, cause a toggling here and then the voltage reverses and it will go down. Here it saturates again at the minus sign, and then it hits again the low threshold, and so we have an oscillator, which is very similar to what we had before, except that we have this saturation part here, okay? We have saturation here, and we have a saturation here. So we can actually use this oscillator to measure current. This will be very similar to what we had before, except that this is now a self-oscillating circuit. This is the non-linear inductor, this is the tor a toroid, and here is the current way we want to measure. Again, we assume uh, this is like one turn, and then we have ten turns here, just for demonstration. This idea is not new. Actually, it was published in 1991, and this is the paper. This is the original paper, the first paper. And you see here, where well, they're saying the operation amplifier, but actually it's used as a comparator. So this is the nonlinear part. This is actually the coupling to the sensed current. I'm showing it here as one turn, and of course it could be a number of turns, so it could be a number a different turns ratio. And here they're showing this waveform that I've showed before. This is when the inductor goes into saturation, and this is the lower limit threshold, and this is the upper threshold. So this is basically this idea, and again it was actually first published in 1991, but then there are many of course, papers that followed up, and uh, there, there are some more recent paper which are, of course, uh, improving it. And I'm not going into all the fine details, just to to explain the basics of this concept. So now I'm going to run a simulation to get a better understanding of what is really going on. I have here a comparator. This is now a inductor which is built around the same toroid I was talking about earlier. This represents the sensed current. What I'm looking at is at this current here. I'm looking at this current. Now there is a dependent source here which is used as a power amplifier you might say because this output here th is not sufficient to provide the current needed to get this uh, core into saturation. So this is like a buffer, and we have the same voltage, except that this, of course, can provide any current that is needed. So this is basically this circuit here. And again, we have this uh, divider here, which um, cause these uh, two thresholds, like a Schmidt trigger, and we measure the current here. So here it is. So without any sense current, we have a symmetrical waveform. It's a little bit uh, different. I'm showing here the inductance is lower, so therefore we have a higher current here than we had it before. So we see here, this is where the in inductor goes into saturation, the core. And then, then this is the higher threshold, and this is the low threshold of this uh, Schmidt trigger. And here is, of course, oscillating. Now, without any sense current, it's symmetrical. Now, if I have a current that I'm measuring, it is pushing the BH curve higher or lower. Consequently, this waveform becomes non-symmetrical. And therefore, this area here or here and the area here are not the same. That is here 
they are the same area and here because we are pushing the operating point by the current the sensed current this area is not the same so therefore there is an average current now here while here we don't have an average current when the sense current is zero so this current is now can be measured as a measure of the sense current and indeed we are getting a very linear curve in a certain range and again this is the output this is the average current of this excitation you might say or self excitation of this nonlinear inductor this is the measured current this is the oscillator here we have the square wave and here we are measuring the average current of the inductor which again is a function of this sense current however if we push the BH curve higher and higher by having a larger and larger current we move from this linear region this is zero here and this is zero here we move toward a non-linear part and eventually actually everything collapses why is this well the reason is that if the sense current is relatively small relatively then we push this uh, curve bh curve a little bit higher so we have this asymmetry between these two areas and then of course as the current goes higher this asymmetry increases but as we reach this uh, saturation level here it is then there is no extra gain if we have a larger sense current okay so the uh, we increase the current but this area does not change much as before so therefore we lose the sensitivity here and eventually we push the curve bh curve into saturation permanently and this will be here and then as we push it into saturation we have just a fixed low inductance inductor because we are now always in saturation because of the sense very high sense current and so it's oscillating but it's not does not have an any average value to it and this will be the end of the story so the useful range will be from here to here so you have to watch not to go over excitation or over sensing of the current again another way to sense the output would be actually to look at the duty cycle now if we have here an average current which means that we have an average voltage here now knowing that the average voltage on an inductor by the way it could be a nonlinear or linear inductor the average voltage is zero so the average voltage here is like the average voltage here now the average voltage here is actually this square wave waveform and the average voltage is in fact the duty cycle times the maximum voltage so by measuring the duty cycle here rather than, than the current here we get actually the same information and this could be um, perhaps a simpler way to look at the output in this circuit indeed Kemet company has a sensor that is apparently built around this concept this is from Kemet and what they are showing here is this oscillator in this case it's a full wave oscillator it's operating the same way of course and measuring the duty cycle here they can get the output voltage and here we are showing it here the duty cycle will be the ratio between the on and off times of the output of this oscillator and here I'm showing the case of no current sense so it's symmetrical so therefore the uh, duty cycle is exactly 50 percent but then as we have a sense current then of course we move to an asymmetrical waveform and here for example is the duty cycle 
60%. Also here, we have the same phenomena. We have a linear portion here. This is the linear portion. And then as we push uh, the BH curve into saturation by having a very high sensed current, then of course we are losing uh, this uh, output and eventually it collapses down. So this is the end of this part two. Hopefully I'm going to have the part three and four. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.